Good morning and welcome to our service of worship. Welcome to Ascension Port Perry in Ontario, Canada, wherever you're joining us from. And I hope this day as we celebrate the third Sunday in Lent and continue our journey towards Easter, that you will find in this service today, in the music, the prayers, the readings, that you will find God's comfort, encouragement, and challenge. Uh, we record this service on the Friday before Sunday, and today, this Friday, March 5th, is World Day of Prayer. And so we offer our prayers in conjunction with those who are praying around the world, and I hope that some of you were able to access those services online or on television. Our service begins with a great hymn, Be Thou My Vision, which you can find in Common Praise if you have that handy 505. I invite you to find our order of service on our website, ascensionportperry.com, on the blog page with this Sunday as the title. We begin with the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We begin our services during Lent with our confession. You raise the dead to life in the spirit. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You bring pardon and peace to the broken in heart. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You make one by your spirit the torn and divided. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Hear the words of God's forgiveness. May the God of love and power forgive you and free you from your sins, heal and strengthen you by the Spirit, and raise you to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. And let us pray together the collect prayer appointed for this Sunday. God of glory and might, speak to us with your wisdom that we might truly hear you. Display your majesty that we might truly see you. Transform the chaos of our lives with the clarity of your call. 
that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. Amen. And now we will have the readings. A reading from Corinthians. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For the Jews de demand signs and the Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes through the, all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. It is rising from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and nothing is hid from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. And the ordinance of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey, and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is, there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. A reading from the Gospel of John. The Passover of the Jews was near and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, doves, and money changers sitting at their table. Making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. 
And his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the, the, the temple of his body. After he, he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he had said this, and they believed that the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us start with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we ask that you would open our hearts and our minds to your living word. Help us to hear it and to live it so that others might know your love, your warm embrace, your forgiveness, and your hope and healing in this world. This we pray in your name. Amen. Now I want to start by asking you a question. If you were given the opportunity to travel back in time to the first century in Israel and to meet Jesus, perhaps to spend an afternoon with him, a few hours, which story from the Gospels would you choose to suddenly be transported into? Maybe the feeding of the 5,000, or when he taught on the hillside, or perhaps when he shared dinner with neighbors and friends and outcasts. You know, I can't imagine that any one of us, or if there was one of us, we might not pipe up so quickly, would choose to travel back in time into the story that we heard told in today's gospel passage. This drama that takes place in the temple court. What seems to be an angry Jesus making a mess of things. Now the Gospel of John puts this story front and center placing it right after Jesus' first miracle, which is, of course, turning the water into wine. The other Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, place this particular story just before Jesus' passion. So at a very different time in the storyline. The fact that it is placed in different timelines does not diminish or even negate the authenticity and the meaning of this story. For ancient storytellers, meaning in the midst of the story absolutely trumped factual or actual timing. And I believe that John is saying something by placing this story where he does. Now first, a historical refresher on temple policy and practice. I know you're all probably very familiar with all of this, but just in case. This was, of course, the time prior to the Passover, a time for preparation. And people came from all over, Israel and even farther afield, because they were required to attend to Jerusalem to the festivals whenever they were able. And so they make their way to Jerusalem and they spend a good portion of a week there. And when they arrive, of course, they have business that they need to take care of in preparation. One of the things that they must do is all men over the age of 20 have to pay a temple tax. This is, you could say, an obligatory tithe. God spoke to Moses in Exodus and made it very clear that for the priests to keep up the temple and all the things that needed to happen, that the people of Israel through the men of Israel needed to pay this tax. It was first collected during the time of census but then became a common practice to collect it when people could make their way to Jerusalem for festivals. Now at the time of Jesus, the common currency was the Roman denarius, 
And unfortunately, that was not what God prescribed as the temple tax. The temple tax was the shekel. I think it was a half shekel. There is difference uh, in terms of how much of a shekel there was to be owed. But nonetheless, it had to be a shekel. And so that's why the money changers are found in the temple. Along with paying the tax, they also had to provide an animal for sacrifice. And so they would purchase an animal according to what they could afford. Doves were probably the cheapest, lambs or sheep more common, and the cattle most expensive. And so that is why also, as they came to the temple, all of these things were available to them. Now, as I read this story, this year, a couple of things stand out for me and I want to share them with you that I think that they may speak to us and help us to ponder our own call as the church in this time. First, what struck me this year is that this story is not a spur of the moment event. It's not a sudden eruption of righteous anger or Jesus just losing his cool. The text itself tells us that Jesus picked up cords and wove them together into a whip. If someone is in a moment of great passion, they usually don't sit down to make something. This very action, this pause in the drama, invites us to consider the intentionality behind what Jesus does. It is significant because no matter where the story takes place in the whole narrative, this action sets the temple priests very much against Jesus and gives them, in fact, legal justification for their outrage. Jesus is very much in his right mind and he is purposeful as he undertakes this dramatic and disrupt disruptive action. The second thing that struck me this time in reading this passage was that Jesus is making a profound statement about the relationship of God with God's people. What was happening in the temple that day was not, by the standards of the Hebrew scriptures, wrong. In fact, it was explicitly prescribed, as I have already mentioned above. But what was once meant as a pathway to relationship with God for the Jewish people had become a circus of commerce duty, obligation, and for many, oppression. The tax and the cost of both traveling to Jerusalem for the festival and then having to purchase an animal for sacrifice was prohibitive for many in Jesus' time. There isn't much doubt that corruption was rampant and that the moneylenders no doubt took a cut of the profits, a healthy cut at times. And so what was, as I said, meant as a pathway or an open door to God had really become a barrier or a wall with no doors, a barrier that excluded many people. And Jesus, as God incarnate, was done with it. Jesus was sent as God amongst us to reopen the doorways that allowed all of God's beloved children to have access to the God who created them and loves them. I believe that John places this story at the beginning of his gospel because he tells the whole story a little bit differently than the other gospel writers. Not in opposition to what they say, but simply drawing our attention to deep truths of the gospels in other ways. Where the other Gospels place this disruption just before Jesus' death and resurrection, pointing to those events as central to the open door. John places it here at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, drawing our attention to the open door as being very much the life, the teaching, the practices of Jesus as God amongst us. As though to say, look not only at my death and resurrection, but look at my whole life, my actions, my teachings, my way of being in the world, and see the open door in all of it. 
This is a profound word to the church, and I invite us to hear it this day. Established religious practices that have outlived their open door policy need to be disrupted and cast out of the congregation of God's people. And we've seen this happen many times throughout the history of the church. And it has always been, unfortunately, disruptive, often violent, and never easy. For there are forces, even in the guise of the good, that work against opening the door for all people to hear and to know God's loving embrace. We've seen this disruption during times like the Protestant Re uh, Reformation, when practices like indulgences, where people pay to have their sins forgiven, to put it simply, when practices like that were overturned and abandoned. In more recent history, perhaps it was the disruption of the civil rights movement that led to the abolishment of segregated congregations, though sadly, we're still not there in practice. This is important, this story. If somewhat dis disruptive, it does uh, invite us to ask, in what ways is the spirit of Christ working in our midst to disrupt acceptable practices that are no longer open doors for others? In what ways is the spirit of Christ inviting us to intentionally weave cords that will enable us to break down those exclusionary walls? It's not an easy word for us to hear today, and it's not an easy question for us to ask ourselves, especially when we've experienced perhaps one of the most disruptive years in our experience as a church. But it is a question that Jesus forces us to ask because the heart of God is always, always about open doors, acceptance, love, and access. And even God's own prescribed practices may have to go by the wayside when they no longer allow those doors to be fully open.
Let us continue by offering our prayers to the, for the church, the world, and for our own community. God of power and wisdom, from the covenant given to us through Moses, you have left us each clear direction for our daily lives. Embolden us to change our unfaithful ways, to choose the desire to love you above all else in this life, and to actively seek to fulfill our spiritual destiny in the next. The response to Lord in your mercy will be, hear our prayer. Lord God, we pray for our spiritual leaders, both in the Anglican Church of Canada and throughout the world. Support them in these difficult times, granting them wisdom and patience, so that they might guide us both by their words and actions. We pray in particular for Linda, our primate, Andrew, our diocesan bishop, Rusilla, our regional bishop, and Ruthann, our priest. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, give us strength to make our voices heard by the political leaders of the world, in our country and in our community. Help us to find the words and energy to inspire and require positive, life-giving action for all your people, but especially those suffering from poverty, violence, and discrimination. We pray in particular for the people of Myanmar, Hong Kong, Nigeria, Mexico, and the indigenous people both in our country and throughout the world. We pray for people of different colors, different religions, and different sexual orientations. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, in the social justice and advocacy prayer cycle, we pray for the parish of Penetanguishene and Wabashin, its deacons cupboard and its bi-weekly breakfast and lunch programs. For Church of the Redeemer Bluer Street, its weekday meal program, street outreach and other supports for homeless and marginally housed people. It's Indigenous Solidarity Working Group, Creation Matters Group and the Refugee Resettlement Program. And we pray for Church of the Resurrection, its community garden, monthly common table, support of Sanctuary, the Scott Mission and Dale Ministries, refugee sponsorship and side door youth drop-in centers. In our diocesan prayer cycle, we pray for all saints in Peterborough. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, restore hope in all who are suffering, whether in body or in mind, and give comfort to all who care for them. Let us pray in particular for those we hold dear and for those who have requested our prayers. We pray for Scott, John, Lorraine, Paul, Bill, Carrie, Linda, Carrie, Jean and Wayne, Rondolyn, and Michelle, and any other names you wish to lift up in prayer at this time. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Lord God, we pray for those who have passed from this earthly life and are now rejoicing in your heavenly care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we pause in this moment to offer you our heartfelt thanksgivings, intercessions, and petitions. We are particularly thankful for, excess, success, excuse me, for a successful virtual vestry for the promise of vaccinations in the coming months, and for the hope of gathering together physically very soon, and for longer days and warmer weather. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Dear God, keep us mindful of you in all that we do this coming week. Let us watch out for our neighbors and for the strangers in our midst. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we continue with the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught us, which gathers all our prayers into one. And so together we say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. 
Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Blessed by God's wisdom, let us go forth refreshed and renewed. Called by Christ, we go now to serve. Amazed by God's love, we go now to love. And may you know the blessing of God, the one who only opens doors and invites us in. May you know the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and may this blessing be with you this day and always. Amen. We conclude our time of worship together by singing, I heard the voice of Jesus say, Let us go now from this time together to love and serve our Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> 